Good evening, everyone. I am Zina Chauhan, training and education leader, G Health Healthcare Ultrasound. I welcome you all to today's webinar: an approach to diagnosis of common congenital heart defects in fetus powered by Wallison series. The fetal heart is a significant focus in pregnancy management, as the detection, diagnosis, and the management of congenital heart diseases is of primary importance. And our today's webinar will going to cover the same aspect. Our endeavor is to bring the best faculties in the field of women's health ultrasound to share their clinical experience and insight. And we are privileged and honored to have Dr. Balu Vedyanathan as the faculty for today's webinar. A very welcome to you, sir. Dr. Balu Vedyanathan is a clinical professor, pediatric cardiology. and the head of fetal cardiology division amrita institute of medical sciences kochi and in kerala his focus areas of interest are prenatal diagnosis of congenital heart defects advanced 3d 4d stick fetal echocardiography training in fetal heart screening protocols and the major career achievement are of He is the official training coordinator for Government of Kerala and National Health Mission Kerala in the fetal heart training program for obstetricians and radiologists. He is also a national coordinator of fetal cardiology working group of Society of Fetal Medicine of India and Pediatric Cardiology Society of India. He is a trainer in the fetal heart education programs. of the international society of ultrasound in obstetrics and gynecology he is also a member of global fetal heart focus group of wallison g austria global trainer for wallison g in 3d 4d fetal echocardiography asean and the south asia segments and he has a major clinical academic achievements that he has established the fetal cardiology division at aims which is one of the largest dedicated fetal cardiology services in asia also he has pioneered the concept of prenatal diagnosis and planned delivery of neonates with critical congenital heart defects and he has performed the first successful in utero intervention for a fetus with structural heart defect which is the fetal balloon aortic wall dilatation in the state of kerala and he has delivered more than 300 lectures in various global professional platforms including world congress of pediatric cardiology and fetal medicine foundation congress conducted more than 75 hands on laptop based online training workshop in fetal echo in national and international forums also he has published more than 50 papers in the domain of fetal cardiology in various national and international peer review index journals and textbook in the past 15 years and he is a convener in fetal cardiology working group of pediatric cardiac society of india society of fetal medicine of india member of american college of cardiology indian academy of pediatric pediatrics international society of ultrasound in obstetric and gynecology cardiological society of india the lists are many and uh, without wasting time now uh, now i would encourage uh, i welcome you sir to this uh, webinar and uh, over to you before that i would encourage our viewers to keep sending question and queries to us using the chat box sir will address them all at the end of the session a uh, very warm welcome to you sir over to you okay thank you zinath uh that was a rather generous introduction so without much ado i am going to start sharing my screen and let's start the uh, presentation can you see my screen now yes yes sir only for it first okay fine so uh, welcome all this is the first of the three uh, lectures in this webinar series uh, on fetal echocardiography and uh, this is uh, actually going to deal the common uh, issue of diagnosis of congenital heart defects in the fetus by the conventional 2d imaging in the subsequent workshop we are going to talk about 3d 4d stick uh, fetal echocardiography and how it helps us additionally and uh, in addition to the 2d and we also have a session on fetal arrhythmia 
Now, we all know that congenital heart defect is a very common problem. In fact, it's one of the most common congenital malformations. And in the prenatal ultrasound for detection of uh, common birth defects, I think one of the uh, most important challenges which obstetricians, radiologists, and fetal medicine people face is the accurate diagnosis, prognostication, and management of congenital heart defects. The prevalence of uh, congenital heart defects is remarkably same in most of the published series. It occurs in about six to eight per thousand live births, which is roughly one in 120. Of these, about 25% are critical congenital heart defects. Now, if you take a country like India, which has about 25 million births in a year, a large number of babies with congenital heart defects are conceived and born. Rough, something like 250,000 will be born, of which at least 100,000 will be severe enough and can be detected in utero. When we talk about fetal heart evaluation, we can discuss different levels of expertise. The first is a primary screening uh, for all pregnancies, which typically occurs at the level of obstetricians. And the scans are often done by obstetricians or sometimes by radiologists. Then comes the secondary level, which is the standard uh, mid-trimester anomaly scan. And this is where most of the diagnosis is made. And very often counseling is uh, done. And either the decision to refer to a pediatric cardiologist or not will be taken at this level. So this is the kind of this most of the guidelines are focusing on this particular level of expertise. And then we have the third level, which is at the level where you are endeavoring to deliver pediatric cardiac care for the fetus, which is involving the pediatric or fetal cardiologist and a teamwork. So my focus today is going to mainly on the first and the second levels of expertise. The most uh, uh, common and the most uh, sort of preferred protocol for the fetal heart evaluation is the ISOAC protocol, which is called the extended basic uh, evaluation of fetal heart. And as shown below in this algorithm, we can see that there are different views which we obtained. And typically, it is obtained by a sweep from the caudal to the cranial direction in the transverse plane. So when we do the sweep, we see several views, starting from the abdominal situs, in which you see the stomach on the left side and the liver on the right side. The iota will be to the left of the spine and the IVC will be to the right of the spine. After that, we see the four chamber view in which we have a checklist to evaluate the four chamber view, not just four chambers, but looking at symmetry, squeeze, the septa, the crux of the heart, the, 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 the identification of the ventricles, the area behind the heart and so on. Then we go to the outflow tracts, of which the first outflow is the LVOT. And specifically, we look at the septo-iotic continuity in this uh, image. And then we look at the right ventricular outflow tract, which should cross the LVOT. And then the three-vessel view, in which the most anterior vessel is PA, the middle is iota, and the posterior one is SVC. And finally, we see the three-vessel tracheal view. And typically, we interrogate this view with color flow Doppler, and we see the joining of the ductal and the aortic arch in a classic V formation with the apex of the V to the left of the spine. I think these views are familiar for most of you attending this webinar. But what we are going to do in this session is we are going to actually look at the screening of the fetal heart and identification of the abnormalities specifically using three views, that is, the four chamber view and the situs is often included in this. The outflow track views, which is the LVOT and the crossing of the outflows, and the three vessel view. The three vessel and the three VT view are often packaged together. Most of the abnormalities or the severe abnormalities can be used if you correctly do these views and identify what is normal and what is not normal. Right. So the format is. I am going to discuss 10 common anomalies and I will show you pictures. And in this particular session, it is not that I am going to talk for two hours and you are going to listen. No, it is not going to be happening like that. I am going to ask you questions. So before you ask me questions, I am going to ask you questions. And I expect you to answer. I will give you the options. And then you will be uh, responding to my uh, questions, which is like an MCQ. We will see how you responded in the audience call with my IT team will support me on that. And then 
I'm going to discuss each of this diagnosis in detail and give you clues for imaging and for diagnosing them and the possible differential diagnosis. So that is going to be the format for today, an interactive format. Okay, so let's take the first step forward and we start with the four chamber view. So this is something which everybody is expected to do. If you are putting an ultrasound on a pregnant woman's tummy and a claim that you are going to scan the fetus or doing the anomaly scan, and this is a minimum thing, minimum requirement. But this is a mighty important view. If you analyze this view very correctly, it will help us to demarcate congenital heart defects into two groups. Those who have two intact ventricles, which usually means that they are all correctable by heart surgery. And then you have the group where there are, don't have two ventricles, typically have a hypoplasia of one of the ventricles, resulting in what we call a univentricular heart physiology, a single ventricle physiology. Such hearts can only be palliated. So a lot of information is obtained from this view. In addition, we can also look at very fine abnormalities as we see the examples later and even pick up clues for very subtle abnormalities using the four chamber view. So let us see the first example now. So in all my slides and all my uh, movies, I have marked uh, the left and right, you typically using left for L for left and R for right. And also you may find this box uh, on the screen, which is showing L for left, R for right, A for anterior and P for posterior. And this is to orient you towards the heart. So this is a movie and I'm going to play this movie and uh, you pay attention. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds for each of these movies so that you uh, look at this carefully. It's not that you are going to look at it very passively. A question is going to come uh, for you uh, as soon as you finish seeing these examples. So this is the first example. The left and the right are marked and uh, uh, you can see the heart. Obviously, it's not a normal heart. And then we see the color flow of the same. The left and right are marked to, you know, to help you with which is the, uh, which side of the heart is what. And uh, you can see the color flow and something is very st strikingly visible to you. So keep uh, this image in your brain. So you saw the grayscale and now you saw the color, the color, color of the color flow mapping of the four chamber view. So even though this is an abnormality of the four chamber view, I'm going to show you the outflow tracks of this, uh, of this patient as well. So these are the outflow tracks. And the what is marked as AA is the ascending iota. And you can see the measurement also there, 2.3 uh, millimeters. And the Z score is minus 7. So obviously it tells you something. And finally, the three vessel tracheal view with color flow. The pulmonary artery is shown as PA showing the blue flow and iota is shown as AO exhibiting the red flow. So you saw the all the pictures so I, and now this is a question for you. So the question uh, for the audience Paul which all of you are expected to respond and uh, is that all the following are components of the diagnosis. I'm go not going to ask you what is the diagnosis. I know you will tell the diagnosis but what I want you to answer this all the following are components of the diagnosis except choice A is apex formed by the right ventricle, choice B is absence of LV inflow and outflow, choice C is large VSD, and choice 4 is foramen ovale shunting left to right. So I want you to pick the choice which is incorrect. So I'm going to give you some time, 30 seconds, and all of you should respond. If we see very less response, then that means that you are going to see less number of uh, cases. So I want all the people attending this webinar to respond to these uh, uh, choices. So choice A is apex formed by the right ventricle. B is absence of LV inflow and outflow. C is large VSD and D is for aminoval shunting left to right. Okay, I think that uh, should be enough. And uh, now I want my IT team to display the results of the audience poll. IT team, 
Can I have the results of the audience poll? Question number one, please. Okay, right. So we have 62% of you showing answer C as the exception. 16% have shown that foramen novel left to right shunt is wrong. 18% have shown that absence of LV inflow and outflow. That's the wrong answer. And 4% has actually responded that the apex is formed by the right ventricle is the incorrect answer. So let me share my uh, screen uh, back again. So, right. So Jason. I'm going to, I'm going to, can I have my screen back? Yes, sir. You can share it. You can share it. It will overtake my screen. Okay. So, right. Perfect. So let us see what is this diagnosis. So obviously that is a man standing on the bus stop will tell that that's an abnormal heart. And this is hyperplastic left heart syndrome. And I'm surprised that even for this, only 62% got the right answer. So we'll see what are the components. So 38% got the answers wrong here. So the, what are the features of four chamber view in the hyperplastic left heart syndrome? The first thing is that this is a left ventricle and the apex is formed by the right ventricle. So that is actually a correct thing. The apex of the uh, heart is formed by the right ventricle. So choice number A is correct actually. Now when you look at the color flow mapping, you see that there is absolutely no mitral inflow, nothing. So that is also right. Choice number B is also right. And what is happening to the left atrial blood? The left atrial blood cannot cross the mitral valve. So the only exit for the left atrial blood is through the foramen ovale. So you get an exclusive left to right shunt across the foramen ovale. So that is also the correct answer. So the LV is small, hyperplastic, the apex is formed by the right ventricle. On color Doppler, there is complete absence of inflow from the left atrium to the left ventricle, that is mitral atresia. And there is a complete left to right shunt across the foramen ovae. When you look at the aortic arch, classically these patients have aortic atresia. So there will be no forward flow from the LV to the aorta. So there will be a retrograde flow into the aortic arch as shown here that red flow into the aorta is retrograde flow. And when we look at the picture of the aortic arch in the sagittal view, so I'm showing you two pictures here, a 3D rendered picture on the bottom and the grayscale with color flow mapping on the top. AA is ascending aorta and D is ductus arteriosus. And you can see that there is a classical reverse flow into the aortic arch. This means that the, uh, the aortic blood flow is completely dependent on the patency of the ductus arteriosus. And this is what is called a duct dependent system circulation after birth. So uh, quite obviously the three A, uh, B and D are correct. Now there is a variety of HLHs called HLHs with restrictive foramen ovale. So here the foramen ovale is restrictive. And in that case, what we find is that the left atrial pressure will be very high. And typically you get bulging large pulmonary veins. So these are the pulmonary veins in this and they are dilated. That's because of the fact that there is no atrial septal communication here. The blood which comes to the left atrium has no outlet, cannot go through the mitral valve, cannot go to the right atrium because the ASD is restrictive. And this can be actually diagnosed by using um, hemodynamic evaluation of the pulmonary vein Doppler. In a normal heart, when you put a Doppler into the pulmonary vein, you typically get a waveforms like this. There will be a systolic wave, S, and a diastolic wave, and a small atrial reversal wave. That's the arrow is pointing towards a small atrial reversal wave. But in HLHs with restrictive foramen ovale, the pulmonary vein pressures are elevated, and we get a very, very prominent A reversal wave. That's called the AR wave in pulmonary vein Doppler. This is virtually pathognomonic of HLHs with restrictive foramen ovale. Now, what is an important differential diagnosis with which you can often mislabel as HLHs? So look at this heart. The left and the right are marked. And look at this color and look at, the, this is a still picture of the same. Uh, the, the left and the right ventricle are marked. And this is uh, another type of heart, which is HLHs. So in this entity, what we call ventricular disproportion, 
the apex of the heart is still formed by the left ventricle. As we can see, the red arrow is going all the way to the apex, while in HLHs, the LV is not apex forming. While in the ventricular disproportion, the RV, even though it is larger, doesn't form the apex, while in HLHs, the apex of the heart is formed by the right ventricle. So this is a crucial difference. So we need to look at which chamber of the heart is forming the apex, and this helps us to differentiate between ventricular disproportion and HHs. The second thing which we can also do to distinguish between ventricular disproportion and hypoplastic left heart syndrome is to look at the patency of the mitral valve in color flow. Now, in this picture, we can see that there is absolutely nothing flowing into the mitral valve. You see here is completely no blood is flowing into the, across the mitral valve. While you look at this picture, we can see that the mitral valve is clearly patent. That means that there is no mitral atresia. So the two useful points to differentiate HLHs from ventricular disproportion is the apex forming LV in ventricular disproportion and presence of a patent mitral valve inflow. So we come back to our case and uh, discuss the answer. So the question was all the following are components of the diagnosis except the so apex formed by the, the diagnosis was hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Apex formed by the right ventricle was correct. Absence of LV inflow and outflow, that was correct. Foramen ovale shunting left to right was also correct, and, but large VSD. Typically, in hyperplastic left heart syndrome, you don't find a VSD. 62% of you got this answer right. So 38% uh, have got work to do. So you need to understand that HLHS, we are essentially meaning a very, very specific diagnosis. So I'm not going to ask you what is the diagnosis because most of you know the diagnosis. So I have made it a little more interesting by asking you questions with except and so on. Right. Now let us move on to the second case. So this is again a very, very easy diagnosis and uh, most of you will say only one thing and I will also say the same thing. So this is a four chamber view and this is a picture in picture, one grayscale on left side and the color flow on the right side and you can obviously find that the, the one chamber of the heart is pretty much enlarged and now this is the outflow tracks if you look carefully where I have written PA you find a very diminutive vessel and you can even look if you look carefully I hope the bandwidth is good and you can see the movie light well and even if you don't see it also is okay the pulmonary artery is it's in fact is much smaller than the annotation which I have put there. My annotation is much bigger than the actual PA. And if you look very, very carefully into this movie with color flow, and you look at that, there is a flash of red flow into the PA, which means that there is a retrograde flow into the pulmonary artery happening. There is no forward flow. So you saw the two pictures, the four chamber view and the outflow tract. Now, this is a question for you. Nothing is going to be very easy. So the answer, the questions for you is this. The following conditions can cause low pressure tricuspid regurgitation except. So the key is low pressure tricuspid regurgitation except. So the choices which you have are Epstein's anomaly, B is tricuspid valve dysplasia, and C is pulmonary atresia with intact septum. So the question is very clear. Of this three, one condition does not cause low pressure TR. Or it means one of these three conditions causes high pressure TR. So I want you to tell that particular entity. Of this three, two of them are very similar in hemodynamics, but one is different. So you have about 30 seconds to, to answer this. While I take a sip of water, since the choices are only three, maybe you can take 20 seconds. Okay, I think that should be enough. Yes, I'll give them five more seconds. Okay, IT, show me the results of this audience poll now. Right. Wow. So about 
two third of you have voted for uh, the choice C, pulmonary atresia with intact septum. And about 15% have voted for Epstein's anomaly and tricuspid valve dysplasia. Wow. So can I go back to my screen? Yes, I'm going to share my presentation again. Right, so let us talk about something about tricuspid valve pathology. So when you talk about tricuspid valve disease, most of you have only one diagnosis, that is Epstein's anomaly. And you just pack your bags and go home, write Epstein's anomaly as a diagnosis, and that's it. End of the story for you. There is a, another diagnosis called tricuspid valve dysplasia. That is very similar, mimicking Epstein's, and we are going to have this differential diagnosis um, in the next few slides. And then there are two more entities. One is pulmonary atresia intact septum with TR. It can very closely mimic, and as you will see in one of those uh, present uh, pictures soon. And there is also this entity called ductal constriction with TR. That typically happens in late uh, pregnancy. So let us first look at the first differential diagnosis, which is tricuspid valve dysplasia. So I'm going to play two hearts. So this is Epstein's anomaly, and this is uh, tricuspid valve dysplasia. So what is the striking difference between the, before I talk about the differences, what are the similarities? Obviously, the heart is quite big in both. The right atrium is uh, really enlarged. The RV also may be enlarged. And if you put color, you get a lot of tear. But what's the difference? The first is you look at the level of insertion of the tricuspid valve. So that's the first difference. Now, when you look at the anatomy of the tricuspid valve, in Epstein's anomaly, classically, the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve will be displaced more inferiorly towards the apex of the right ventricle. So that is what you see, the downward displacement of the insertion of the septal uh, leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So that is characterizing the uh, Epstein's anomaly. In tricuspid valve dysplasia, the leaflets insert at the same level. There is no displacement. So this is 3D rendered picture of the same Epstein's anomaly. You can see the, the differential insertion. The, 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 the tricuspid valve has a much more apical insertion. So you see the mitral valve is at a much higher level. While in tricuspid valve dysplasia, there isn't much of this uh, downward displacement at all. The tricuspid valve, the normal offsetting will be maintained. That's it. So this is the first difference between tricuspid valve dysplasia and Epstein's anomaly. The second is when you put color, you look at the origin of the TR jet in color flow mapping. So this is Epstein's anomaly, and you see where the TR is coming from, and this is tricuspid valve dysplasia. In Epstein's anomaly, the TR jet appears to come somewhere in the middle of the RV cavity. That's because the tricuspid valve is displaced much more apically. That's what you see here. The, the TR jet arises from the middle of the RV cavity. However, in tricuspid valve dysplasia, the TR jet arises at the level of the tricuspid valve annulus. So there is no middle of the RV cavity here. The third uh, difference between the two entities is the right ventricular cavity. Now, in this is Epstein's anomaly. You can see that the right ventricular cavity is rather small, while in uh, tricuspid valve dysplasia, typically the right ventricular cavity is well formed. Now, the right ventricle in Epstein is something which we have to understand very well. So it is divided into two parts. The true right ventricle is actually found in the very apex. And then there is what is called the atrialized RV due to the downward displacement of the tricuspid valve. So in this picture, the blue um, an annotation is the true RV, while the green annotation is the atrialized RV. So that is atrialized RV, and that's the true RV. So more severe the Epstein's, the more will be the displacement. And hence, the true right ventricular cavity will be smaller and smaller. While in tricuspid valve dysplasia, there is nothing like this happening. There is only one right ventricle, no atrialized RV. So the right ventricular cavity is larger. So there are three differences between Epstein's and tricuspid valve dysplasia. The level of insertion of the annulus, the origin of the TR jet, and the right ventricle Side, cavity size. Now let us look at the hemodynamic correlates, and that will give the answer to my question as well. So this is the first scenario. I'm putting TR, and this is also severe TR. In one go, you know, you will find that these hearts look very, very similar. The TR also looks severe. Now I'm putting a, a 
Doppler, continuous Doppler or pulse wave Doppler. Some machines have continuous wave Doppler. And look at the TR, that velocity here. It is 1.8 meter per second. And if you convert this 1.8 into millimeters of mercury using the uh, Bernoulli's equation, it will work out to a right uh, TR jet pressure of about roughly about uh, 2025. And in this case, you find that the TR jet velocity is about 6 meters per second. That is really, really increased. So this entity, the first one is called low pressure TR, and this entity is called high pressure TR. Examples of low pressure TR is Epstein's and tricuspid valve dysplasia, while high pressure TR occurs in pulmonary atresia with intact septum or ductal constriction. Now, the difference, the entity low pressure TR means the right ventricular pressure is normal. So that is the case in Epstein's and tricuspid valve dysplasia. But in PA IVS and ductal constriction, the right ventricular pressure is high. It's a hypertensive RV, and that's the reason why you get high velocity TR signal. So the hemodynamic correlation is that Epstein's and tricuspid valve dysplasia cause low pressure TR, while PA IVS and ductal constriction cause high pressure TR. I hope this is clear. So when we come to the case number uh, two, the audience question was, which of the following conditions cause low pressure TR except? Uh, so the answer is pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum because this causes high pressure tricuspid regurgitation. Epstein's and tricuspid valve dysplasia cause low pressure tricuspid regurgitation. So we have covered two scenarios. Now we move on to the third one, and this is obviously not going to be so easy, but let us see. This picture can be a bit difficult, however you can see. Again, this is not a four chamber view, but as we say, the, the stomach is the one which leads to the heart, and after some time all of us will start to get up because we will start feeling the pangs, you know. The stomach this will start complaining, the situs will start complaining. So let me get the stomach out of the way before the hunger starts to set in. So you see the left and right, the ST is a stomach. So that's obviously on the right side. So right means it's on the correct side. And you find the IOTA and IVC somewhat in this particular position. So this is what we are going to discuss soon. Now this is a four chamber view. And you see something here. And this doesn't need too much of explanation. The left and the right are marked. So you can see that apical four chamber view, there is something very obviously abnormal in this four chamber view. Keep watching this picture. Okay. Right? Okay. Now the outflow tracks. So the outflow tracks I'm showing and um, the anterior vessel is not bifurcating and is a large vessel while the posterior vessel, which is seen just under that, seems to be dividing. So I'm giving you a clue that what is which great artery. So you look at this picture again carefully. So I showed you pictures starting from the abdominal situs, where the stomach appeared to be all right, but the iota and the IVC we will discuss. Four chamber view was abnormal, the outflow tract looked abnormal, and the aortic arch, which is seen in this color picture, looks normal. And I'm showing you one more thing in the four chamber view, the same four chamber view. And the arrow is pointing towards an additional clue. Okay, so there are four clues from these images. And I hope you have seen this enough. And now let us ask this question to the audience. So this, all this is pointing towards a clearly one diagnosis. So I'm not going to tell you what is this diagnosis, nor am I going to ask you what is the diagnosis. But tell me, all the following are components of the diagnosis except. So one of these is not a feature of this diagnosis. First is, our option is AV septal defect. Second option B is anomalous pulmonary vein drainage. Option C is juxtaposed IVC and iota. That means IVC and iota are on the same side of the spine. And option number four is interrupted IVC. So this definitely needs uh, 30 seconds for answering. So you saw the pictures. 
you can infer the diagnosis and you can look at all these uh, four choices a b c d and tell me which of the following components do not fit in with this diagnosis a b c or d I think this deserves 30 seconds, maybe another five more seconds. Okay, I think that should be all right. So my friend, IT friend, tell me what is the results of this particular audience poll show? Very good. So we have 50% of you um, answering, 52% rather, showing that interrupted IVC is not a feature of this. 21.6%, oh my, that's really, really surprising. Uh, uh, answering that AV septal defect is, doesn't belong, fit in with this diagnosis, while the others is what people are saying. So let me again go back to my presentation. Okay, so, this is a pretty straightforward diagnosis. This is right isomerism. So the features which I showed you were, which we are going to discuss is we have an abnormal situs, which I'll discuss in the next slide. There is an unbalanced AV septal defect, which again we'll be discussing. And there is a univentricular heart. The great vessels were transposed. The pulmonary artery was smaller than the iota, so that's implying pulmonary stenosis. There was the TAPVC. In this case, it is an intracardiac TAPVC. The systemic venous connections are normal here, and there is sinus rhythm. So how do you differentiate between right and left isomerism? The actual way to differentiate is by using the atrial morphology. Typically, the RA is trabeculated. It has pectinate muscles, and the coronary sinus opens. The left atrium is smooth. There are no pectinate muscles, and the pulmonary veins open. Actually, the, 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 the pathologies differentiate right and left isomerism using the appendages. The RA appendage is broad-based, while the LA appendage is slender like a finger. But these are sometimes difficult by imaging. But what you can image is the systemic veins. The classical feature of right isomerism is that you find the IVC and the iota on the same side of the spine. That is called juxtaposition of IVC and iota. While in left isomerism, you have the double vessel sign due to interrupted IVC and dilated azagos. So that is the, how you differentiate between the right and left isomerism. The position of stomach, liver, heart, bronchi, etc. are not useful. Of course, bronchus will be difficult to image in the fetus. So let us look at the appendages. Now look at this picture. You see two appendages here, and I mark them as right atrial appendage. They are typically triangular with a very broad base. While, and this is like the LA appendage, look at the difference, is much more slender and like a finger. It is possible to look at these appendages, but often you may miss them. So we can't often rely on appendages to diagnose and differentiate between the two isomerism. So what we typically use is we look at the uh, venous anatomy. So in right isomerism, as seen in this cartoon, the stomach can be anywhere, but typically the iota and the IVC will be found on the same side. And this is what we found here. This is the midline here, what the white line and the iota and IVC was on the same side of the spine, on the right side here. So that is called the juxtaposition of the iota and the IVC. So this often gives us a very good clue towards the possibility of right isomerism. In the left isomerism, typically you have what is called a double vessel sign. So you can see there over there, that's the double vessel sign. And here also you can see the double vessel sign. That is the re reason because the vein is posterior, the IVC is interrupted, and the dilated azagos vein, vein will be seen posterior to the iota. So this is very characteristic of left isomerism, the double vessel sign. This can be seen both in the four-chamber view as well as in the abdominal situs view. So this is how you differentiate the right and left isomerism in the true sense. The intracardiac anatomy, of course, it gives clues the, in both cases, you find AV septal defect. Typically, in right isomerism, you have an unbalanced AV septal defect, while in left isomerism, more commonly, you find a balanced AV septal defect. I will show you what is unbalanced and balanced in the next slide. 
So typically, right isomerism, since you have an unbalanced AV septal defect, you have a univentricular type of heart, while in left isomerism, often we get two ventricles. So sometimes the ventricular morphology is abnormal in left isomerism. The outflow tracts, classical in right isomerism is an abnormal relationship of outflow tract and pulmonary stenosis or atresia is common. In left isomerism, usually we get normally related. Sometimes you get double outlet RV and aortic obstruction is more common. And finally, pulmonary veins. TAPVC is very common in right isomerism. In left isomerism, a total allomerous pulmonary vein connection is not very common. So these are the differences in the intracardiac anatomy between the two entities. So this is what you call a balanced type of AV septal defect. There's a single AV valve which opens equally to both the ventricles. While this is what we found in this case, there was only a single AV valve and that was predominantly committed towards the right ventricle. So a balanced AV septal defect often is found as an isolated anomaly or it is more common in left isomerism while unbalanced uh, AV septal defect is a part of isomerism syndrome, usually in right isomerism. So this is IVC interruption. So you see that there is no IVC and you can see a prominent azygos vein and we see the two parallel vessels in the parasagittal view and that's the dilated azygos vein. This dilated azygos vein gives the double vessel sign on the four chamber and situs view. And finally, the area behind the heart what we saw was the confluent chamber of the total anomalous pulmonary vein connection. And in this particular case, as we can see here, the CC is a common chamber that is draining into the portal circulation. So that was an infracardiac TAPVC. So the case example which I showed you was a classical example of right isomerism and all the components were clearly um, discernible. Conduction disturbances that's typically bradycardia is very common in the left isomerism. So this is, you are seeing a very slow heart rate. The ventricular rate is only 54 and there is evidence of complete heart block. So this is very pathognomonic of left isomerism. So case three was an example of right isomerism. So the AV septal defect, TAPVC, juxtaposed IVC and IOTA all are components. While indirected IVC of course is not a component of right isomerism. So that is the answer here. Interrupted IVC is a component of left isomerism. So that is the case three. Okay, now this is a really much more interesting one. So this is again a fourth case, a right heart abnormality. So you can, this is not very difficult to make this diagnosis. The question could be difficult. So the left and the right are marked. So you can clearly make out which of the ventricles is smaller. Also look at the ventricular septum carefully. Also look at the atrioventricular valves carefully. The left and the right always correlate with these annotations. Now here you see the color flow. You can see and clearly make out what's happening here. The inflow is what I'm interested in. Look at both the inflows very carefully and look at the color flow into both the inflows. The outflow tracks, the first outflow cross from LV, that is the iota. And the second outflow is from the RV, that's a PA. The three vessel view is shown. And you can see that there is a difference in the size between the PA and IOTA, again, suggesting something to you. So the four chamber and the outflow and the three vessel view are shown to you. So this is a very simple question. So I thought this will make it very easy. I expect most of you to get this diagnosis correct. Sometimes after three difficult questions, it's good to put an easy question. So you have only 15 seconds to get this answer right. So the diagnosis, choice A is pulmonary atresia with small right ventricle. Choice B is tricuspid atresia with VSD and pulmonic stenosis. And choice C is tetralogy of phallus. Right, I think we will move on to the audience poll in five seconds. Right, I think since this was a very easy question, I expect a lot of people to get the answer right. IT team, can I have the results of the poll, please? Okay. And this is pretty much uh, what I expected. Most of you have got the answer as tricuspid atresia. 
my god some of you have got the answer as tetralogy of fallow that is a bit surprising pa ivs pulmonary atresia with small rv is okay in fact if that 8.5 person had got pulmonary atresia that i would have been happier but tetralogy of fallow i think i'm a bit really surprised with that answer which means that we obviously have to do these sessions again and again so let us go back to the presentation and uh, this is no big deal this is tricuspid atresia so that's the picture the right ventricle is small the left ventricle is obviously the bigger ventricle the tricuspid valve is completely atrotic it's not opening at all there is a ventricular septal defect as you can see here so the blood coming from the right atrium cannot go into the right ventricle so the whole blood has to go across the foramen ovale into the left atrium that's so, so the atrial septal defect or the foramen ovale is very very important for the uh, for the life of these babies so when you discuss the hemodynamics there is absolutely no flow from the right atrium to the right ventricle the tricuspid valve is completely atrotic so the entire right atrial blood goes across the foramen ovale into the left atrium and then it goes into the left ventricle the only entry point into the right ventricle is the vsd so that is very important the vsd is actually the rv inlet as well as outlet in tricuspid atresia remember the statement the vsd is the rv inlet and the outlet in tricuspid in tricuspid atresia because that's where the blood is going to come into the rv and that's the only source of the blood flow into the rv outlet okay so i have drawn here two variants of tricuspid atresia so the first variant is uh, where you have a normally related rate arteries that is nrga so in tricuspid atresia with nrga the pulmonary artery comes from the right ventricle so blood will come from ra to la and then to lv and through the vsd the blood will go to, to the rv and then to the pulmonary artery so if the vsd is small the amount of blood flowing into the pulmonary artery will become lesser and if there is no vsd at all then there will be absolutely no source of blood to flow into the pulmonary artery the second variety is the tricuspid atresia with tga so here the pulmonary artery comes from the left ventricle while the aorta comes from the right ventricle in this case again the same hemodynamics apply blood from the right atrium has to go into the right left atrium and then to the left ventricle the only entry point for the blood into the right ventricle is the vsd so if the vsd is small the amount of blood entering the right ventricle also will be less and which vessel is coming out from the right ventricle here the aorta so if the vsd is small the amount of flow into the aorta also will be less so the aorta also will be small and hence that forms a substrate for coarctation that is the difference so that is why in tricuspid atresia it is not only important to look at the four chamber view you have to evaluate the size of the vsd and also you have to clearly understand the great artery relationship and clearly demonstrate which great artery is arising from the right ventricle so in the first case in this case is tricuspid atresia with nrga with a small vsd so you see the three vessel view the pa is smaller than the aorta and the the pulmonary artery bifurcation is seen well and in the color flow you can see the aorta is having a bigger flow compared to pa so that means that there is pulmonary stenosis here normally related rate arteries now let us see another example so here we see again a lateral view you see the right ventricle is quite small here as shown in this annotations and you see the vsd there the arrow is pointing and under under color flow you can see the color flow also this is a small vsd it's not a generous vsd and now let us look at the outflows in fact it is a transposed outflow you see the aorta is anterior coming from the right ventricle pa is coming from the left ventricle and you look at the size of the aorta it is quite small so this is tricuspid atresia with tga a small vsd and hence the aorta also has become small and this is the one which can very high chance of having a coarctation or even an aortic arch interruption so this tells you how important it is to look at the heart as a whole not just just one view and start talking about it and say that you are the expert no in fact cardiology is all about understanding hemodynamics and trying to correlate with what is going to happen to this baby after birth so this is a very very good example of how 
the hemodynamics is different in tricuspid atresia based on the different type of great artery relationship, size of VSD, etc. Now, this is a very close differential diagnosis of uh, tricuspid atresia. This is again a small right ventricle here and, uh, and uh, on 4D stick rendering. The difference is that the ventricular septum is intact here. So, this is an example of PAIVS uh, with small right ventricle. So, if somebody said PAIVS, it's okay, but then the VSD was staring at you. So, again, no excuses. Just like we found the foramen ovale in the hyperplastic left heart situations, in these states also, if the foramen ovale is restrictive, as what we can see here, in this case, the foramen ovale is restrictive and bulging towards the left atrium. And what is, will you find? The right atrial pressure will be high here. And because the blood coming to the right atrium cannot go to the right ventricle, cannot go to the left atrium, so the right atrial pressure will increase. And this will reflect into the ductus venosus Doppler, just like we saw a prominent air reversal in the pulmonary vein Doppler in HLHS with restrictive PFO in any right heart pathology, say tricuspid atresia, PAIVS, or whatever. If you have a restrictive PFO, you have a high right atrial pressure causing a prominent air reversal in the DV Doppler. So hemodynamics is really interesting, and it is quite possible to put Doppler in the right perspective and understand the hemodynamics in each of these entities. So that is, uh, so we have covered HLHs, ventricular disproportion, most of the right heart lesions, PIVS, tricuspid atresia, Epstein, tricuspid dysplasia, everything. And so this particular uh, question, question number four was a giveaway. It's a very easy answer. The answer was tricuspid atresia with VSD. The great artery relationship was normally related and hence there was pulmonic stenosis. Most of you got it right, but some of you, 8.5% of you voted for tetralogy of phallus. So now we move on to the next set of cases, that is uh, the outflow tracks. So maybe one minute we will just stand up and take a few breaths, do some stretching and come back. So I need that, so I'm going to take a short break. Stand up, all of you. Hands up, down, up, down, sit, stand, sit, stand, take five deep breaths. Right. You need it because you need to fill your lungs with more oxygen because the cases are going to get a little more difficult and the questions are also going to get more difficult. Right. So let us move on to case number five. The left and right are marked. So these are all apical four-chamber views. So in an apical four-chamber view, I don't need to tell you the ventricles will be on top of your screen and the atrium will be on the bottom of the screen. So that is very easy. And this is the second picture. So the first one was the first picture at the four chamber view. And the second picture is at what we call the LVOT view. You can see that. And then now I'm putting the color flow. It's very, very characteristic color flow. You can see the very typical color flow. And this is a still picture. You can see even some aliasing with a very big vessel coming off. Characteristic pictures. And now we see the outflow tracks. You see two outflow tracks. There is an anterior outflow track which appears smaller. The middle one is big. And now you can see color flow also. So the color flow into both the outflow tracks appears to be blue. The SVC is red, so that is normal. So you see the, saw all the pictures, the four chamber, the LVOT, the, the outflow in color, and now the three vessel view. Okay, so obviously there are no big gusses here. The, the, the diagnosis is very, 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 uh, very familiar to all of you. And uh, the question for you is, all uh, components of the above diagnosis in the fetus, that's, please remember, in the fetus, except choice A is ventricular septal defect, choice B is aortic override, choice C is pulmonic stenosis, 
and choice D is right ventricular hypertrophy. So all are components of the above diagnosis in the fetus except one. So you have to pick the answer which is an exception. This would be a very easy one. So I am going to give you only, only a very short time. Right, so let us move on to the audience poll question. Audience poll, IT team, show me the results of the audience poll. I think some people are saying that the audience poll results is not available for them. I think the audience poll result is only available to me. I am going to tell you because I don't want you to know what you are answering. So that is okay. Right, this is as expected, most of you have got it right. And 85% have answered that RV hypertrophy is not the feature. Very surprisingly, 5% of you have answered that VSD is not a part of this diagnosis. 3.9% has said aortic override is not a part of the diagnosis. Those are a bit surprising. Okay. So let me go back. And uh, so this is tetralogy of fallow. So what are the features of tetralogy of fallow in the fetus? So this is a normal heart and what you find in the LVOT view is the classical septo-aortic continuity. In tetralogy of fallow, the characteristic feature is the loss of septo-aortic continuity. The ventricular septum is shown by the dotted lines and the anterior aortic wall by the continuous bold red line and you see that in the abnormal case, tetralogy of fallow, there is discontinuity. Here again, the lateral view, that is the ventricular septum and this is the anterior aortic wall. And when you have tetralogy, you have a septo-aortic discontinuity. And when there is a septo-aortic discontinuity, you get the VSD in between. That is what we call a malaligned VSD. And some of you who know me, you would have seen me, uh, I mean, heard me describing this VSD as a conoventricular VSD. That means Conoventricular means conal septum is the iotopulmonary septum, that's the anterior aortic wall, and the ventricular septum. So when there is a malalignment between the conal septum and the ventricular septum, we call it a conoventricular VSD. This is a hallmark of tetralogy of fallow, always found. Now, pulmonary stenosis is often seen. So VSD and aortic override automatically becomes mandatory components of tetralogy of fallow. Now, in many cases, including in the fetus, you may find that the pulmonary artery is smaller than the iota, as we can see in this picture. The iota is larger and the PA is smaller. And I always measure some structures like the pulmonary artery. Uh, and th this is the iota, the red. This is the main pulmonary artery. That's the pulmonary valve. That's the right pulmonary artery. And that's the left pulmonary artery. So you take these absolute measurements and you also compute the Z, Z scores and that's based on the gestational age. And this will tell you how small or large a particular structure is with this expected measurement for the gestational age. Very often, the MPA to IOTA ratio is helpful in assessing the severity. And it is also useful in assessing the progression of the pulmonary stenosis. So I'm going to show you the normal MPA IOTA ratio. So this is a normal heart. And the MPA IOTA ratio is about 1.16. The PA is bigger than the IOTA. So this is an example of a mild tough. The MPA iota ratio is about 0.7 or above. And then you have a very severe tough where the MPA iota ratio is less than 0.5. Now, when you say that the PA iota ratio is less than 0.5, you are implying that the pulmonary stenosis is very severe and the baby is likely to have significant cyanosis at the time of birth. Now, these are the clues, imaging clues for severe tough. Now, this is only severe clues for severe tough. Please do not take home the message that these are markers of poor prognosis. If anybody listening to this lecture henceforth uh, calls severe TOF as poor prognosis, that's wrong. Severe TOF only means that the baby is likely to need a newborn intervention. And we are there to take care of that. And you can easily handle the situation. And once the, uh, the, the obstruction is relieved, the baby will behave like a normal TOF only. So these are the clues. The MPA outer ratio of less than 0.5. The Z scores of pulmonary artery, RPA, LPA, less than minus three. 
and if there is a progressive decline in the size of the PA. Second is color flow patterns. So if you put the color into the outflow 3 vessel, uh, 3 BT view, and if you find minimal or no anti-grade flow or retrograde flow, here you see retrograde flow, that means that this is really severe top with duct dependent circulation. This baby has to be delivered in a uh, cardiac center so that an immediate newborn procedures may be needed. And finally, some people have looked at pulmonary well, uh, peak gradients. Typically, at 20 weeks, if the gradient is more than um, uh, 90 centimeters per second, and at 34 weeks, more than 145, some people have used these to define severe TOF. I don't find that very useful. For me, the size of the PA and, in particular, the color flow patterns give the more useful clues. So whenever you find features of severe TOF, it is better to transfer that uh, pregnant uh, delivery, it would do an in utero transfer and deliver the baby in a cardiac center so that the pediatric cardiologist can immediately attend and, uh, and, and take care of the baby. The prognosis is very good even for severe TOF because once you, uh, you know, salvage the newborn situation, the, the subsequent surgical correction is just like regular tetralogy of fallow. We did do different pr procedures like a balloon dilatation of the pulmonary valve or a stending of the right ventricular outflow tract or sometimes a ductal standing in severe TOF, depending upon the choice of the centers. So the audience poll question, the answer obviously was right ventricular hypertrophy. Right ventricular hypertrophy develops much later, typically uh, after birth and sometimes as the child becomes older. A newborn with tetralogy still may not have an RVH. So VSD, aortic override, and pulmonic stenosis are all components of the diagnosis. So we are actually doing well. We are exactly midway uh, through our webinar, and uh, I hope everything is going well. Zenith, is everything well? Just asking you this question, Zenith? Yes, sir. Everything is fine, sir. All the audio, video, everything is going well? Yes, sir. It's going great, sir. Okay, great. Okay, fine, fine. Good. Okay, now this is case number six. And this was referred as abnormal outflows. So I'm showing you the four chamber view. And uh, the right and the left are marked. And now you see the first outflow track, which is coming from the LV. You look carefully. Normally, the LVOT has a very peculiar kind of orientation. In this case, it appears to be different. And now this is the second outflow which is arising from the right ventricle. So it's easy to spot the ventricle where R is, that's the right ventricle. And now you see the second outflow coming from the right ventricle and you have the three vessel view very characteristically you see there. So you have all the components of the diagnosis, the normal four chamber view and not so normal uh, first outflow. The second outflow from the RV also is not normal and you have a very characteristic uh, three vessel view. Now the question for you, there are only three choices here, so it makes your life easy. What is the most specific sign for the diagnosis of this lesion? That is a question. So that is the interesting twist. So again, I'm not going to ask you what is this uh, condition. So what is the most specific sign for the diagnosis of this lesion? So choice A is absence of crossing of outflow. Choice B is a single outflow seen in three vessel view, the so-called I sign. And choice C is the first outflow from the LV bifurcates. The anterior outflow continues as the aortic arch. So your question is, you have to tell me what is the most specific sign for the diagnosis of this lesion from the choices A, B, and C. So you have about 30 seconds for this. We are very well on time. Okay, now let us go to the results of the audience poll. The audience need not worry about the, 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 that some of them are, have actually sent me a feedback that they are not able to see the results. 
but that is going to be visible for me only. Excellent. Wow, this is a very trick question, and uh, the 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 answers, the most specific sign for the diagnosis. Forty-six percent has written absence of crossing of outflows. Eighteen point seven percent have told that the eye sign is the most specific sign, while thirty-four percent have shown that. The choice C, the first outflow from the LV bifurcates, and the anterior outflow continues as the aortic arch. So let us see the discussion of this case. So I'm going to go back to my presentation. So obviously the diagnosis is TGA. So let us see the LV outflow tract. So this is a normal outflow uh, uh, outflow tract. The first outflow is typically the RV, and it comes from uh, so, sorry, the first outflow is the aorta. That comes from the LV, and characteristically, the aorta goes towards the right shoulder, towards the right shoulder. And what did we find here? In this case, the first outflow tract was actually moving towards the spine posteriorly. So, and you can also see that that was bifurcating. So, the first outflow was bifurcating and was running posteriorly. So, the first outflow tract is. Pulmonary artery, and that is coming from the LV. Now let us see the, the both the outflow tracts. So on you have you are seeing both normal and TGA. Now in normal you will find that aorta goes towards the right and pulmonary artery goes towards the left, and there is a crossing. TGA the pulmonary artery is from the LV going posteriorly, and aorta is from the RV is a more anterior outflow. So most of the TGAs have parallel outflows. That is true. That sense it is true. But as I am a pediatric cardiologist, so in some cases, obviously, you some you may find that the outflow tracts can actually even cross in TG. We have found such situations. So in in actual pathology specimens, crossing can be sometimes found because it's a route. So in a strict sense, your answer is okay for an imaging perspective. But in the real sense, the truest sense, the answer is the pulmonary artery comes from the LV and the aorta comes from the right ventricle. So that is the true sense, the 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 answer in TG. So this is a normal uh, uh, outflow. The right ventricle gives rise to PA and that continues as a ductus or the ductus and into the descending aorta. While in TGA, the right ventricle gives rise to the aortic arch. Ascending aorta that continues as transverse arch, and from these pictures you can see how different is the configuration of the two arches. The ductal arch is more like a hockey stick, while in the aortic arch is more like a rounded shape. So if you have that characteristic aortic rounded arch coming as the anterior arch from the right ventricle and a bifurcating PA as a post first vessel posteriorly, that is a hallmark of TGA. So this is again a beautiful rendered picture, as you can see here, a picture of the aortic arch, which is classically the anterior. AAO is ascending aorta, TA is transverse arch, DAO is descending aorta. You can even see the branches of the arch coming, and this is really characteristic that aorta coming from the right ventricle. Now, so the, the, if you say absence of uh, crossing, it is okay. Um, I mean, I will give you. Half mark or maybe uh, even three fourths of a mark. Uh, I sign. I will come to that. I'm going to dismiss that sign. But obviously, the most appropriate answer is the PA arising from the left ventricle. That's a bifurcating vessel, and the aorta is anterior outflow, and that continues as the aortic arch. Now, in transposition, when you do this uh, imaging in the late pregnancy, particularly in the third trimester, you should look at the foramen ovale. And in this paper, which is published way back in 1999 from France, described the possibility of in utero restriction of the foramen ovale and even sometimes ductus arteriosus. So this is ductus arteriosus. And if it's a very unfortunate baby, both of them can become restrictive in utero within the same fetus. That is a real brute of a case because these babies are going to present with extremely severe cyanosis, and they are going to be really, really difficult. To manage, some of them may need an immediate resuscitation, 
shifting to the cattle for an emergency balloon septostomy, and these are very, very high risk uh, fetuses. So it is very important that this is done in all transpositions in the third trimester. There are some other ways to look at it, like pulmonary vein Doppler, but I won't discuss those. But please look at this foramen ovale and ductus arteriosus in third trimester in TGA. Nevertheless, all TGA should be delivered in a pediatric cardiac center. There is no question about that because you never know when these become restrictive. Now, this entity called CCTGA, obviously the difference between a DTGA and a CCTGA is that in DTGA, which is complete transposition, the four-chamber view is normal. But in CCTGA, you have an abnormal four-chamber view where the right ventricle will be on the left side. So the, the pulmonary veins will be going into the left atrium and left atrium connects to the right ventricle. So the, the, the left-sided valve will be at the lower level because the tricuspid valve will be at the left side. So that is what is called the reverse offsetting. So sometimes it is very important to look at the four-chamber view in TGA. You may get very excited with the fact that you don't have crossing of outflows. You find the PA arising from the LV and the anterior outflow is the iota. You get excited. You say, oh, this is TGA. But if you sometimes you miss the four-chamber view, and if there is a reverse offsetting in the four-chamber view, then you have a if again AV, AV discordance and VA discordance, that is double discordance, that is corrected transposition. So in CCTGA, you have the left atrium connecting to the right ventricle and the left AV valve inserting at a lower level and the right atrium connecting to the left ventricle and the right-sided AV valve inserting at a higher level. So that is the CCTGA and that's very important to look at that. Obviously, the outflow tracks in CCTGA will be very similar. The first vessel will be PA from LV and the iota will be from the RV. So we come to this uh, so-called I sign. Uh, this is something which has been described as synonymous with TGA. Yes, I, it is important because uh, it gives you the clue that this could be transposition and perhaps the most important condition to be understood when you get this I sign is TGA. However, it's non-specific. It can be seen in any lesion where the outflow tract are transposed, like complete TGA, TC TGA, Sometimes even in a DORV TGA, and I will show you examples later. Top pulmonary atresia, common arterial trunk, where there's a single outflow, that can also very, 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 very remarkably produce a very similar picture. So, this screening view, the the, the so-called I sign in the three vessel view, yes, it does gives a very useful imaging clue for TGA, but it is not a very specific sign for TGA. It can be seen in any other condition like what I have described below. So the most specific sign that is case number, the question number six, the absence of crossing is actually okay. It is, uh, it is um, reasonably specific, but not the most specific. The I sign is certainly not specific. It's a sensitive sign. That's what we call it. Sensitive to pick up TGA, but not specific. But the most specific would be that the first outflow from the LV is a PA that's bifurcating and the anterior outflow is iota, that's continuing as the iotica, that's a very specific sign. Now we move on to the seventh case. So this is the, this is the uh, four chamber view. The right and the left are marked. Looks remarkably normal. And now you look at the outflow tract, what's happening here. You can see the left and right and the outflow tract is also nicely seen. And now you have the I sign for you again. See, another I sign here, the outflow tract here. So that's, that's the I sign here. And when we put color flow on the outflow tract, this is what you are getting. So you see a very large vessel coming off and then you see something else as well. The left and the right are marked. So you saw the sequence, the normal looking four chamber view, the LV outflow, you showed something. There was the I sign very prominently seen on the three vessel view. And on color, you are seeing this picture. So what's the diagnosis? And this is a trick question for you. In fact, this is a good question. Now, I'm sure that uh, there will be a variety of answers here. So since we have I sign, transposition of gray rate artery is possible. Again, since we have I sign, DORV TGA type is possible. Yes, since we have I sign, a trough with pulmonary atresia is possible. There's one outflow. And since we have I sign, 
common arterial trunk is also possible. So tell me what's the likely that what's the diagnosis here? So you take and take 30 seconds for your answer. Okay, I think that's enough. So let us go to the results of the audience poll. My friend, IT, show me the result of the audience poll. Wow, this is great. So I think this is great. So 2.3% said the diagnosis is TGA. 18% said the diagnosis is uh, double outlet right ventricle. 11% said the diagnosis is TOF with pulmonary atresia. And 69% said the diagnosis is common arterial trunk. Okay. So I'm not going to give the answer yet, but let us just continue with our presentation. Okay, right. So this is what we saw. Actually, you have the four chamber view without color is exhibited here. The left and the right, you see a very large outflow, which is overriding the VSD here. It's very clearly seen. And in fact, you can see in the still picture, two small arteries as well, bifurcating. See that bifurcation? The right pulmonary artery is 1.8 millimeters. The left is 1.5 millimeters, and they are small. And when we put color, you note the direction of flow into the PA. The blue is into the iota. And you see that retrograde flow into the PA? So that blue is into the iota. And you see that's the iotic flow. And you see what's happening in here? That's a reverse flow. So there is a single outflow track, which is a huge vessel, non-bifurcating. And there is a retrograde flow into the into the smaller vessel, which is pulmonary artery. So it makes very easy. So that is the case which we saw. This is a differential diagnosis. Here you see again a normal four chamber view, a large vessel overriding. That's the continuing as the iota. The pulmonary artery seen arising from the iota. And you look at the color flow blue into the PA and blue into the iota. So in this case, what I showed you was a case of a VSD with a single outflow, which is overriding the VSD. And the differential diagnosis of this entity is there are two conditions only, common arterial trunk or truncus arteriosus and top with pulmonary atresia. How will you differentiate? In truncus arteriosus, there is only one trunk and that continues as the iota and gives rise to the PA. So obviously, since the direction of flow is same from the ventricle into both the outflows, the direction has to be same. In top with pulmonary atresia, there is a single outflow, that is the iota, and pulmonary artery is actually fed by the ductus arteriosus, the classical case, and hence the flow is reversed. So in trunk, this is pulmonary atresia, anti-grade flow into the iota, and retrograde flow into the PA. And this is trungus, anti-grade flow into the iota, and anti-grade flow into the PA. So most of you got this answer wrong. You said common arterial trunk, and you missed the retrograde flow of blood into the PA. That is so very well nicely shown here. And this, I, I, I remember my very dear friend Chandrasekhar Kenjale. He's one of the most wonderful radiologists which India has ever produced. And he's no more with us. He was such a close friend of my heart. And I've seen Chandrasekhar actually presenting this differential diagnosis so elegantly. In fact, he described this whole so beautifully that then I actually walked onto a stage and said, you are better than many pediatric cardiologists in understanding the fetus. So it was classical case demonstration of differential diagnosis of a single outflow 
common arterial trunk versus TOF with pulmonary atresia. The major clue is that in TOF with pulmonary atresia, aorta gets anterograde flow, pulmonary artery gets retrograde flow. So that's a reverse flow. While in common arterial trunk, both the outflows get same direction flow. So I think this has made it clear. So the answer for this question is TOF with pulmonary atresia. I think most of you got this answer wrong. Only a very small proportion of you, 10% of you only got this answer correct. So that is again a very, very important differential diagnosis. Right. So now we move on to the eighth case and I promise you the cases are only going to get a little more and more difficult and interesting now. So this is the four chamber view and uh, you can see the left and right are marked. Anterior and posterior are also marked. This is a color flow and believe me that there is a flow into the LV. So this is a three vessel view and the three VT view also. So the PA is on top and I have marked them as well. The iota is in the middle. You see the PA and iota and you can compare the size of the PA and iota also. So the four chamber view gave you a clue and this is a three vessel view and this is a three VT view in color. And the PA is on anterior and you can see the size. The iota is seen there and you can look at the size of the iota as well. So I've given you four chamber view, three vessel view and a three VT view in color. So you can actually make up your mind about what is a likely diagnosis. Okay, so again, what is the most specific sign of this anomaly? So I want you to make the diagnosis and tell me what is the most specific sign of this anomaly? So the options for you are, Option A, ventricular disproportion in four chamber view with LV smaller than the RV, which you saw in the four chamber view movie. The LV was slightly smaller. The second option for you is three vessel view showing an iota smaller than the PA, which also you show. The third option is isthmus shelf with flow turbulence. And the fourth option, D, is reverse flow into the aortic arch. So which of this is a more specific sign of this anomaly? Most specific sign. So you'll take 30 seconds for answering this question. Some of this may look very attractive, but that is obviously not a feature of this diagnosis. There are conditions which mimic this diagnosis, but that is different. Okay, so we, I'm going to sh tell that as well, but this is a particular diagnosis and now I will go to the audience poll. IT, can you show me the results of audience poll for question number eight? Excellent. So I will read out the answers. 8% have responded that it's a four chamber view, ventricular disproportion is the most specific sign. 26% felt the most specific sign is iota smaller than PA in the three vessel view. 40.6% have written that the isthmus shelf with flow turbulence is the right answer. And 26% have written that reverse flow into the aortic arch is the right answer. So let us say whether the audience wins this round or not. Okay, so the diagnosis of this of is this is coarctation of iota. So the screening for the coarctation is typically uh, the four chamber and three vessel. Four chamber shows ventricular disproportion with smaller LV, and three vessel shows a smaller iota. More specific will be the three vessel tracheal view where the isthmus is small and the duct isthmus ratio will come to the next slide. So a smaller isthmus. The high likelihood of surgery, in fact the highest likelihood is a serial reduction in the isthmus size 
and the presence of isthmus shell with the flow disturbance. That is the more specific sign. So the answer is also clearly explained. So the clues from four chamber view is very, very obvious. Ventricular disproportion, LV will be still apex forming. Some cases as what we are seeing here, you may find a dilated coronary sinus. We can see that in this picture where the arrow is pointing. That is usually due to persistent left SVC. But this is very non-specific. It just gets you started with the possibility of coarctation. A useful tip is a three vessel view where you find the iota smaller than the PA. You should look at the Z scores and you compare the size of the iota and the SVC. If the iota is smaller than the SVC, that is an incredibly small iota, very high chance of coarctation. And in the 3VT view, you find the small isthmus, very small isthmus. As it, you can see the iota and PA are marked A and P, and the isthmus is I and the duct is D. The isthmus to duct ratio, if it is less than 0 0.7, or if the isthmus Z score is less than minus two, or if they are coming lesser, lesser and lesser as the pregnancy is advancing, this is a very, very useful sign. But the more specific sign is this ismic shelf and uh, where you get the classical coax shelf. And if you have flow disturbance, you get, that's where the arrow is pointing, the isthmus shelf. This is very, very specific. And uh, that's how we can actually pick up coax. But all this, this is a paper which was published in circulation they looked at all the possible signs and specific signs and they found out that isthmus uh, shelf with flow disturbance is the most uh, specific sign for fetal coarctation. Now, interrupted aortic arch, so that is the elder brother of coarctation. So you see this three vessel view here, SAP is uh, S for the vein and A for the iota and P for the uh, pulmonary artery. T is struck here. So what do, you, what do you find here? The iota is actually not extending further down at all. Only the pulmonary artery is going all the way to the spine. The iota is stopping short. That means it's interrupted. And that's where the interruption is. And what typically happens is the ascending iota that is marked here as AA has a straight course into the neck in, as a nominate artery. That's a very classical picture. And when you put the three VT view color, and this is coarctation, you can see the iota as A and pulmonary artery is P. You can see the ismic shelf and you find that the direction of flow is same. This is interruption, the reverse flow. Typically, inter that reverse flow uh, occurs when there is absolutely no anti-grade flow in the iota. That is more of a feature of interrupted aortic arch uh, or transverse arch hyperplasia than coarct. In coarctation, typically the flow tends to be mostly anti-grade. So the reverse flow is more of a feature of arch interruption or extreme coarct, which is almost like a uh, you know, interruption itself. So that is the reason why the most specific sign would be the isthmus shell with flow disturbance. So in question number eight, I think choices C and D are pretty good, but as per the, the data for coarctation of iota, this case was coarctation. It was not interruption because you could see that in the three VT view, both iota and PA had blue flow. So the isthmus shell with flow turbulence is the most specific sign. Right, so it has been a pretty long session. Now it's, uh, we have half an hour more. So I'm going to go to the final two cases. So this was a primary gravida referred because of right aortic arch. So this is a four chamber view, which looks normal. This is the LVOT coming off. Uh, it looks good. Three vessel view. This is giving you the first clue. The iota and the PA are marked. They look same size, but there is something which is not normal here. And the color also is seeing, look, they seem to be going away or not really. They don't, they don't like each other, it seems in this case. And the three VT view is showing some kind of funny pictures, first uh, something like a U and then there's something else coming up. And finally, this is a three VT view fully. You see here, and this is a rendered kind of a picture. And this is a picture which I would want you to see a little longer. Look at this carefully. Okay. So that is a clue. So you have a normal four chamber view, three vessel view, there was something between the iota and PA and the three VT view with arches, this is a picture. 
Now the question for you, this is a pretty easy question. Which of the following is a complete vascular ring? Complete vascular ring. Choice A is right aortic arch with the left sided ductus. Choice B is right aortic arch with an aberrant subclavian artery. Sorry, it's an aberrant left subclavian artery, not aberrant right. It's an aberrant left subclavian artery. I apologize for that error. Choice number C is a double aortic arch. And choice number D is right arch with the right sided ductus. So which of the following is a complete vascular ring? Choice B, please correct that aberrant uh, uh, subclavian artery is an aberrant left subclavian artery. So maybe I will do the correction right now. Right, so there are no more excuses. This is a, these are your choices. Aberrant left subclavian artery. Okay, let's go on to the audience poll of this question. IT, give me the results of the audience poll for uh, question number nine. Right, not surprisingly, uh, most of you got uh, the answer right, double aortic cards. So that is expected. And uh, right arch with aberrant, sorry, it's, it's all right, it's aberrant left subclavian. That's okay, that's not a big deal. So let us, uh, but some of you have actually got right arch with left sided ductus, right arch with right sided ductus, all as complete vascular ring. Okay. So that is not obviously the right answer. So let us see this uh, case. So this is a normal three vessel view and this is what you get in right aortic arch. So the first clue for the right aortic arch comes from the three vessel view where you find an increased gap between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And that is very evident here. Even in a color flow picture, you find an increased gap between the PA and the aorta. That's because the PA is left and the aorta stays on the right side. Then when we move on to the uh, 3VT view, so this is a normal 3VT view. P is pulmonary artery and A is iota. They converge together as a V-like formation and the V apex of the V will be on the left side of the spine. But in the right arch with the left side ductus, typically you have the U sign. That is what you saw here, the U sign. And this is a color flow of the right arch with the left ductus. This is a normal uh, left arch. And in the right arch with the left sided ductus, typically you have the U sign. That is what you see. But this was not that U sign here. And here, what did you find here? This was a picture which I showed you. Here, A is the ascending aorta and P is the pulmonary artery. The aorta is dividing into two arches. The R is a larger right arch and the L is a smaller left arch. The D is a ductus arteriosus. So, and this is a rendered picture. The aorta has bifurcated into the left uh, the right arch. That's, you can see it very nicely. And there is a ductus also. So this is what is called a lambda sign. The aortic arch divides into the larger right arch and a smaller left arch. The left arch will be anterior to the trachea. The ductus is left sided. So typically the trachea will get compressed between the two branches of the aortic arch and thus it forms a complete vascular ring. So there is no doubt about the fact that the correct answer, the complete vascular ring is the double aortic arch. In most cases of double aortic arch, the dominant arch tends to be the right arch. Usually presence after birth is strider or dysphagia and what we have to do is to divide the smaller arch, which is the, typically the non-dominant left arch is divided to relieve the vascular ring. So I'm just sort of minimizing and giving you the right, uh, making a small correction here. Let's go back and play this. Right. So the choices which I gave you were right arch with left sided ductus, right arch with aberrant left subclavian artery, a double arch and right arch with the right sided ductus. The correct answer was double aortic arch. That's a complete vascular ring. So it's important to make this diagnosis in utero because these babies can have significant strider at birth which will require surgery. So this is the last case and this obviously is not going to be a very easy case. So 
So let us see how many of you get this one right. This one, people who get this right will get some special uh, sort of uh, gifts. So this is the four chamber view. And this patient was referred for right heart enlargement. And you can clearly see that there is something in this. Uh, definitely you can see that the RV looks bigger. So this is a four chamber view. So this is a three vessel view. We say three vessel view, but there is more than three vessels here. And what is very interesting in the color flow is you know the color flow. One of those vessels is red and the other one is blue. And there's even something happening, very interesting happening. Four vessels. You see one, two, three, four. And you see, look at the direction of flow as well. Now we see the bicable view, the SVC and the IVC. Normally they are of equal size, but here look at the difference in size. The SVC is a giant vessel view. So you have ventricular disproportion in four chamber view. You have four vessels in the three vessel view with a very characteristic color flow pattern in the two venous vessels. You find the SVC is big. And there are some more clues on the four chamber view. Look carefully. No arrows yet. Look carefully at the four chamber view. This I am going to play for some time. The subtle clue, if you look carefully at the four chamber view, at the area where you are supposed to look, you will get the clue. Okay, I think most of you would have looked at this even allowing for the lag in the internet. Okay, so case number 10. What is the diagnosis? Choices are persistent left SVC is A. B is double vessel sign with interrupted IVC. C is total anomalous pulmonary vein drainage to the SVC. And fourth and D is the vein of gallon aneurysm. So I put one diagnosis outside the heart and three cardiac diagnosis. And I'll give you one minute to answer this question. So you had a dilated right heart. You saw four vessels in the three vessel view. You saw a dilated SVC. And the four chamber view revisited. There was something else as well, an additional clue, which was actually very obvious in that color still picture which I showed. Okay, so that is the time is up for that. So for the last time, IT, my friend, show me the results of the audience poll. So we had persistent left SVC. We had double vessel sign as an interrupted IVC. TAPVC and vein of Garen. Wonderful. I think all of you deserve prizes. It's extremely surprising that for an answer, which I really expected most of you to answer correctly, that the common arterial trunk, you know, uh, you know, uh, a lot of you got that wrong. But here, a lot of you have got things right. 75% have written a TAPVC. 8.5% have written uh, persistent left SVC. 9% have written double vessel sign and interrupted IVC and 6.6% .6 have written vein of gallon aneurysm. So I'm going back and now let us see this entity. So here I want to bring to your attention the brachiocephalic vein view. So this is a very useful clue for systemic and pulmonary vein abnormalities. It is formed by the confluence of the left jugular and subclavian veins. And it is seen further anterior to the three vessel view. And it crosses the mediastinum and the left brachiocephalic vein drains into the SVC. So that is a BCV. So it is seen anterior to the aortic arch. So it's further anterior to the aortic arch. This is in fact the most anterior structure which you can see in the fetal heart image. So when you have uh, 
the, the variations in BCV, you have the differential diagnosis between persistent left SVC and TAPVC. So when you have four vessels in the three vessel view, the most common condition you think of is the persistent left SVC. So in this picture, you have PA torn by P, iota by A, SVC by S, and then there is this additional vessel which is marked as L. Now, the second is a dilated BCV. Typically, when you have a dilated BCV, you have two conditions, TAPVC or vein of gallon aneurysm. While typically in the persistent left SVC, the brachiocephalic vein is not present. It is absent. The reason is because when you have two SVCs, you don't need the brachiocephalic vein. There will be one right SVC and one left SVC and no connecting vein. So typically in persistent left SVC, you don't have brachiocephalic vein. While in the TAPVC, you have a dilated brachiocephalic vein. So four vessels in the 3VT view, two important differential diagnoses are TAPVC and persistent left SVC. The brachiocephalic vein helps you to differentiate the two. In PL, uh, persistent left SVC, there is no uh, brachiocephalic vein, while in TAPVC, it is typically dilated. The second clue comes from the direction of flow in the fourth vessel. In the persistent left SVC, the, the additional vein typically drains towards the heart. So you get the blue flow. While in the TAPVC, the fourth vessel, that will typically drain upwards. It will be draining towards, away from the heart, towards the SVC. That is towards the supracardiac, uh, that's the supracardiac TAPVC. So the direction of flow will be reversed, that's red. So that is what we found in our case when I put color. One of the veins had blue flow while the other had a red flow. That is, it was a vertical vein which is ascending up. So here we can see it beautifully here. That's the dilated brachiocephalic vein and you can see it that nicely joining the SVC. So this is an example of supracardiac uh, TAPVC. Very, very nicely seen. And this is a rendered picture of a different case. You can see the vertical vein, the nominate dilated brachiocephalic vein draining into the SVC. And CC is a common chamber. In, in fact, you can see actually the, the, the individual pulmonary veins also joining and ascending up into the vertical vein and joining the nominate vein and draining into the SVC. So the clues for supracardiac TAPVC are the area behind the heart first. You see a collecting or the common chamber. So that is very important. Normally between the left atrium and the descending aorta, you don't find any structures, but here you could see the common chamber. The three vessel view, you get four vessels. That is the fourth vessel. And that fourth vessel typically will be anterior to PA. Dilated SVC in the bicaval view. And finally, a dilated brachiocephalic vein in the BCV. When you put all of them together, the diagnosis is supracardiac TAPVC. You can get infracardiac TAPVC very similarly. In that, the difference is that the IVC may be dilated and you will see the common vertical vein will be draining downwards towards the IVC. And I showed that example when I showed you the picture of right isomerism. So the answer for this question was TAPVC to SVC or supracardiac TAPVC. So most of you got this answer correct. Now, so uh, I have completed the 10 scenarios and I have discussed differentials around that. I felt it is much better to discuss this way rather than just talking about some diagnosis and showing some pictures, which is a usual way. So I'm going to add a few points about how do we counsel. Now, any, any, any evaluation of the fetus, it's not just a heart, it's a fetus as a whole. Nowadays, I join most of you in the fact that we need to start this process very early. In fact, I am a very strong advocate for the first trimester screening now. You should do the NT scan for every single case. You should do the double or triple markers. You should also look at the basic anomaly during the first trimester. And that will help you to differentiate the pregnancies into high risk and low risk. And anybody who pass, doesn't pass the first trimester test needs to be evaluated in detail. And if there is a need for doing a genetic test, do all that. So even before we go to the heart, it is important to look at the fetus as a whole, extra cardiac anomalies, genetic anomalies, etc. After that, you start with the four chamber view. Anybody who has an abnormal four chamber view, where one of the ventricles is hypoplastic, we are looking at the possibility of a complex heart defect, typically of the univentricular heart physiology. 
That means that they are only subjected to palliative procedures after birth, and hence they do have a long way ahead with difficult life. However, if the four chamber view is normal with two intact ventricles, you are looking at the possibility of a heart defect which can be completely corrected after birth with surgery. Classical example is TGA. Then you look at the outflow tracts, you look at their number, their relationship, and whether they are obstructed. So you get a number of conditions in the outflow tracts like tetralogy, TGA, DORV, coarctation, and so on. And you also need to fathom and factor in the possibility that whether this lesion can progress in utero. For example, a tetralogy at 22 weeks can progress towards a more severe tetralogy or even a pulmonary atresia uh, as the pregnancy advances. Same way, a ventricular disproportion can progress into a coarctation. So that is important. And finally, what is the most important thing is that towards the third trimester, when you evaluate, you need to look at the possibility whether this baby can present with the critical circulation at birth, like what we call duct dependent circulation. And this is where the 3VT view is exceptionally important. If you have reverse flow into one of the outflow tracts, like iota means it's iotic obstruction, PA means it's PA obstruction, transposition, look at restrictive foramen ovale and transposition, and all this means that it's a very critical circulation, and such babies should be only delivered in a pediatric cardiac center. And this is the counseling algorithm which I would recommend. And the four-chamber view, obviously, I'm coming back to that. It's a very important view. So it picks up simple things like, like HLHs or Epstein's or right isomerism. These are all looking at very complex, severe diagnosis, and this should be diagnosed early in pregnancy. While the outflow tracts looks at correctable lesions mostly, like tetralogy or transposition or coarctation, and most of them are, are correctable, and some of them, like TGA and coarctation, are critical as well. So if you want to put all congenital heart defects in the fetus, the first group is, of course, uh, things like you know small VSD, which are not even worth mentioning in the fetus, mild pulmonic stenosis, bicuspid aortic valve, persistent left SVC. These are all very, very small things. And these are not, you know, I would not want to discuss this in the context of a fetal heart, uh, you know, CHD discussion, because these are really, really benign conditions. If you pick up a small VST, so be it. Many of them will close in utero itself, or they will close after birth. So you don't need to terminate such pregnancies for that. So you just tell them that, yes, it's a very small benign lesion. You should get an echo just to confirm everything after birth. Then you have situations like, you know, uh, lesions like a large VSD or coarctation or TAPVC, which is non-obstructed, typically have very good prognosis. I put ASD because I'm just talking in terms of a primum ASD. The second MASD is, of course, cannot be diagnosed in utero. These are all lesions which have excellent outcomes, near normal expect life expectancy. Then you have entities like tetralogy, TGA, most of DORVs, obstructed TAPVCs, coarctation in the newborn, all of them have very good prognosis. They have, they are all, uh, uh, you know, they can be corrected totally, what we call feasible for anatomical repair. 95% is adult survival. All these conditions, there may be a 10% chance of reoperations, particularly tetralogy or TGA, DORV type of TGA, etc. But mostly these are all things which we can really uh, salvage well. Now, when we move on to more difficult entities, and most of them have either a single outflow, like a top pulmonary atresia, or a common arterial trunk. Some of the single ventricle hearts, like univentricular hearts, like tricuspid atresia, where the left ventricle is a single ventricle, complex DORV, most of these entities have uh, a need uh, repeated operations. Either they can only be palliated, or if you are doing an anatomical repair, like a top pulmonary atresia, we need an artificial graft called the conduit to bridge the missing pulmonary artery. For common arterial trunk, also there is only one outflow, and you need a conduit from RV to PA. So that means that reoperations are universal here, and they have about 85% adult survival. So I will put their prognosis as reasonable. However, you have some entities like uh, hyperplastic left heart syndrome. Heterotaxy, that's the other word for isomeric hearts, very complex forms of pulmonary atresia where you don't see pulmonary arteries, MAPCAS, newborn Epstein's, these are all really difficult cases. And uh, either the repairs are very complex 
maybe somebody else may argue that their survival are improving but in most situations these are difficult very very difficult especially entities like hyperplastic left heart syndrome and these are the lesions one should try to pick up very early in pregnancy so that all options can be discussed with the family so pediatric cardiology and newborn cardiology has uh, received a great blessing uh, with prenatal diagnosis this is a baby newborn baby who is in our icu recovering after an arterial switch for tga nowadays uh, in our center prenatal tgas are operated on the third day of life and by 10th day 12th day they are discharged they are so well and most of them do well so it is very important that don't see all congenital heart defects as a fetus as the same thing no they are different you need to understand the difference in the outcomes the treatment options between all the different entities so the, the starting point for you is to make the correct diagnosis and after the correct diagnosis counsel correctly and counsel, counsel scientifically don't put your judgments on to the counseling counsel according to what science is telling you do not hesitate to refer the patient to a pediatric cardiologist for a second opinion especially in correctable problems and then the management can be taken over with the multidisciplinary team that is my message i think we are succeeding uh, very well through this webinars and i uh, thank all of you for listening to this uh, program we have about 10 minutes left for the question and answer session and uh, i'll hand over to the it team and uh, the coordinator for the for the, uh, the 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 question and answer session yeah thank you very much sir uh, it was a wonderful and interactive session i i'm sure that audience uh, and the viewers uh, would have enjoyed that uh, uh, polling and the question answers thing so it will refresh their uh, uh, knowledge about the fetal heart and many of them have learned how to uh, do that so there are sir we have uh, received many questions uh, are there so i would take it one by one to you okay so i am going to actually use the white board now yes let us okay. have the white board just in case okay can okay. they see the white board now yes sir, it's visible yes, yes sir. sir okay fine so let us have the white board in case something is needed yes so we have 10 uh, minutes in it so you can start asking the questions so lady sure, i sir. just move this away yes. uh, so the this is first question i am taking which is asked many times uh, and this so so what are the uh, uh, cardiac abnormalities are there which can be detected in level 1 scan sir uh by level, level one, one first semester scanning so like that sir can be okay is it level 1 uh, i mean that is first trimester yes sir okay so i am going to say first trimester the first so the first uh, response to that question is that i am not an expert in first trimester fetal uh, fetal heart evaluation this is primarily the domain of the fetal medicine people okay so, but that is that is fine but now i am going to answer that question first trimester of course uh, like you know the four chamber abnormalities i think that would be the most obvious most people who get good pictures in first trimester should be able to see whether the four chambers are intact and whether both the inflows are patent i think that is quite possible in first trimester that is one so i guess if there is a hyperplasia which is already formed in first trimester you should be able to pick it up if there is a complex isomerism which is there in the first trimester you should be able to pick it up so that's uh, very very clear the second of course will be the outflow anomalies which will i am sure it will need color and uh, especially the 3 vt view i have seen simon actually showing pictures of these simon mark and uh, which is so good you know he's shown very very nice pictures of first trimester you know outflow anomalies and particularly that uh, that v sign that is very useful when you put color in the 3 vt view this can obviously help you to see whether there are two outflows whether they are normally related I, I am sure that the good ones amongst you can pick up a transposition, and uh, sometimes you can pick up a pulmonary atresia or a common arterial trunk, and so on. Right. So I think I will use, as far as a pediatric cardiologist is concerned, the first trimester should not be a diagnostic, uh, you know, evaluation. 
it is good enough if you suspect that there is a heart disease or a complex heart disease. But there are a lot of problems. A first trimester, the specificity of the first trimester evaluation is questionable. And the problem is there is no one to arbitrate you at all. You give a diagnosis and ends up with an obvious uh, choice from the patient. And there is nobody to arbitrate your diagnosis or even, you know, even, uh, you know, confirm whether it is correct. Because how many of you are doing the, the, the uh, fetal autopsy to confirm? So I will put a lot of caution towards uh, conf giving a confirmatory diagnosis during the first trimester. That is number one. Number two is a number of conditions can be actually missed in first trimester. This includes evolving lesions. Many of the outflow anomalies like pulmonic stenosis or aortic stenosis, coarctation of aorta, even for that matter, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. It can evolve as a pregnancy evolve as, as progresses. A cardiac rhythm problems obviously mostly are missed in first trimester. Cardiac tumors are missed. So I think the first trimester evaluation, in my opinion, should be restricted to pick up the most obvious things and the most complex things. And it should be a multi-system evaluation and not just a heart. I will give more importance to, like, what is the NT? Is there a possibility of an associated genetic problem? Are there major extra cardiac anomalies? Is the heart defect a part of a complex multi-system problem? This is what I am more interested than saying that I diagnosed a bicuspidiatic valve in first trimester. Somebody going around town saying that I diagnosed this in first trimester. I can show this picture. I could see a TAPVC in first trimester. No, that's not the kind of an approach which I would prefer. And I'm sure that with more and more better and high resolution machines coming up, most of us will end up picking up a lot of problems in first trimester. But I will use the information which we get in first trimester with great degree of caution because there are no arbitrators for the first trimester diagnosis. Okay. And so the next question is, uh, uh, how to differentiate between ASD and foramen ovale? Okay, I think this is a question, like, you know, if you have a primum ASD, that is the one which we are expected to diagnose in utero, because primum ASD is where the septum primum will be missing. It's a part of the AVST complex. Typically, you lose the offsetting of the valves, and, uh, and it's it's actually a, a part of, it's, it's like a type of AVSD, atrioventricular septal defect. But diagnosing a primum ASD is important because uh, obviously it's a part of AVSD, which means that associated conditions could be there. So you need to rule out trisomy 21 when you have AV septal defect. So that is why it's important. I don't think you should try to distinguish between a secondum ASD and a foramen ovale. That is really ridiculous to try to do that in the fetus because most of the time your effort to distinguish that will be wrong. And uh, there is no point, and you are not expected to find, diagnose an ASD in the fetus, except the primum ASD. Okay, so there is obviously that the answer for that would be a very, very clear answer. Please do not try to diagnose a, a, the fossa ovalis ASD or a second ASD in the fetus. Then there is a third type of ASD called sinus venous ASD. Those are all going to be a very, very difficult diagnosis. Again, you know, you have ASD. This is a totally correctable problem. And it will be much better if you actually don't go into such details because all of them have healthy lives once corrected. So I don't think I can distinguish between a fossa ovalis ASD and a foramen ovale in the, in the fetus. I can diagnose the primum ASD. I would definitely would want to diagnose the primum ASD because of its associated defects. And the sinus venosus ASD, I don't think most people can even uh, think of diagnosing such entities. It's very, very difficult. Okay, sir. So the next question is, uh, uh, it's like, can you explain the difference between the mitral atresia and HLSS? Okay, that is a good question. Now, mitral atresia, is, see, look, I think it's very important to understand each term by what it means. Mitral atresia means, it just means that mitral valve is atritic. It is not patent. Okay. Now, downstream, you can have different uh, possibilities. Sometimes you may have uh, a, a very large VSD with the mitral atresia. There could be, in most of the situations, the mitral atresia is associated with a univentricular type of heart. But then there are different permutations and combinations possible in mitral atresia. The outflow tracks are typically, can be highly variable. 
in mitral atresia. You can have normally related outflows, you can have trans from in mitral atresia, all combinations. When you say hypoplastic left heart syndrome, you are describing a very specific entity. And classical components of the hypoplastic left heart are one, the LV is hypoplastic. Typically, it will be very, very bright, what we call endocardial fibroelastosis. It's because it's a very hyper echoic walls. The LV will be not forming the apex of the heart. The RV will form the apex of the heart. Typically, the ventricular septum is intact in HLHs. So that is about the left ventricle. Most of cases of HLHs have mitral atresia or extremely severely stenosed mitral valve, almost becoming atritic, with the result that the foramen ovale will mandatorily, obligatorily, it will shunt from left to right. And the final component of HLHs is typically aortic atresia. There's no anti-grade flow into the iota, and it's a typically a retrograde flow. So when we say hypoplastic left heart syndrome in this entirety, you mean mitral atresia, aortic atresia, and a hypoplastic LV, which is not forming the apex of the heart. This is the entity which I call HLHS. You, many of you call, give names like even sometimes uh, heterotaxy or right? isomerism with a small LV is uh, termed as HLHS by, by some of some people. Those are not, uh, you know, entities for me. I am a cardiologist and I go by clearly by anatomy and pathology correlates when I say a particular entity. So I hope this is clear. Thank you, sir. So the next question is uh, uh, that most of the anomalies are being diagnosed at 20 weeks. Can uh, the question is should we evaluate a little later, like tw 24 weeks or? or right. That is a very, very, very relevant question. I think. This is a question which is completely diametrically opposite from the first trimester persons, you know. I know that uh, in fetal medicine, there is a tremendous interest to diagnose the cardiac anomalies even before the baby is conceived, you know. First trimester is now moving about eight weeks and uh, nine weeks. But, you know, uh, it is okay. I mean, I, I'm not going to question that, uh, that development. However, let us be more, more, more realistic here. See, we are, uh, you know, we are, I'm, I'm talking to people who are in South Asia, which is India, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, then uh, Nepal, and Myanmar, Myanmar and you know, I, I, I mean, in large portions, yesterday I had a symposium, which I was addressing senior pediatricians of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And the discussion there was in most places of India, except maybe some centers in urban India and uh, where fetal medicine specialists are there. In largest part of all these countries, there is absolutely no concept of fetal heart evaluation. Nobody does first trimester. Nobody even does NT. Majority of people don't, uh, pregnancies don't get mid-trimester anomaly scans. So with the result, you know, majority of the fetal cardiac anomalies are missed only. First trimester, you forget first trimester. Even second trimester, they are missed. For me, Whenever somebody looks at the fetal heart, at, I mean, the fetus at any point of pregnancy, irrespective of which period of gestation, if you pick up an anomaly before the baby is born, it's always helpful. Let me illustrate it with a classical example, which happened this year, real life scenario. A woman was diagnosed to have a heart defect, suspected to heart defect at 38 weeks pregnancy. She was referred to a pediatric cardiologist. At 38 weeks and four, uh, four days, they took four days to go to pediatric cardiologist because they were from a very rural part of India. They, the pediatric cardiologist who was trained by us, diagnosed this condition as transposition of great arteries, TGA. This was from another state of, uh, away not from Kerala, from outside Kerala. And this patient was advised a uh, delivery in a pediatric cardiac center. The woman came and very, very Surprisingly, the screen, and now we live in a very peculiar time, and peculiar circumstances add on. So the woman had COVID positivity. The baby was delivered in our center. The baby underwent an arterial switch, and baby survived and discharged. And uh, I did not see the family before the, because of obvious restrictions. I saw the baby, but finally, after everything was over, we reunited the family, and the baby is doing exceptionally well. When was the diagnosis made? 38 weeks and 5 days. Life-saving. If that baby was born in the rural place, the baby would have died. 
So who are, what is, what are you talking about first trimester diagnosis? You know, diagnosis at any time in pregnancy is good enough. Same way, if you diagnose a hypoplastic left heart at 38 weeks and 5 days, till you can tell this is a complex problem, family has some time. Yesterday I saw another case, HLHS which came 3 day old baby in cardiogenic shock. No diagnosis, no prenatal diagnosis, no postnatal diagnosis. Baby came in shock and we diagnosed hypoplastic left heart in our center. And the baby was so sick and acidotic that there was no option but to go into an ICU. So and, and now it's a real difficult situation. So if you have a prenatal diagnosis any time before delivery, we can counsel and so that appropriate decisions can be made regarding managing the baby after birth. The problem is most people who make diagnosis, they don't know what happens to these babies after the babies are born. And I see the full picture because I see these patients after they are born, we treat them. So I know how much difference and impact a diagnosis makes irrespective of this. In our series, about 40% of our, all fetal CHDs were picked up for the first time in third trimester. We have more than 500 cases uh, diagnosed in the third trimester and even a third trimester diagnosis can have a very significant impact, uh, impact uh, for the uh, management after birth. So I think your question is very correct. You should continue to evaluate irrespective and if there is no proper fetal heart evaluation done in early pregnancies, you should try to do it whenever it is possible. Even if somebody was referred for an, uh, you know, growth scan at 28, 30 weeks, Till if the heart was not seen before, please look at it. I thought this is a very good question. That's why I spend more time in answering it. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And the next question is, sir, is the isolated ventricular inversion possible causing TGA type of physiology? Whoever has asked this question, I will answer that person privately. Okay. You note down this person and uh, we will and can direct this question to me through my email. Zena, that will be your job because this is a very complex thing and if I go into this discussion, you know, then we will have problem. I, it's, I've been talking for two hours now. So I will be continuing to talk for another one hour at least to answer this question. Answer the uh, the question. This is a repeated one, which is repeated by many. So uh, to explain TOF and TAP VC little bit so again. Uh, I didn't understand. Uh, TOF so, and tetralogy of fellow and TAP VC, sir. TAPVC. Yes, sir. TAPVC. Okay. I think this is these are two entirely different diagnoses. You know. Tetralogy of fallow is obviously a situation where you have a VSD due to malalignment of the ventricular septum and the aortic wall. That's a loss of septoaortic discontinuity, aortic override, and pulmonary stenosis. That is tetralogy. So obviously that's a completely different entity. Total anomalous pulmonary vein drainage is a totally different diagnosis. Normally the pulmonary veins drain to the left atrium. Here they drain to the right side of the heart. They can drain to the SVC or inside the right atrium or to the IVC. So we call it supracardiac if it goes to SVC, infracardiac if it goes to IVC, and cardiac type of TAPVC goes into the right atrium. So completely different uh, entities. And uh, <clears throat> so obviously uh, the implications are different. The good thing is common thing for both is that both are conditions which can be completely corrected after birth by surgery and the long-term outcomes are excellent for both, especially for TAPVC, the long-term long -term outcomes are even more really, really supremely good. So that's the only commonality, but regarding the imaging, they are two completely different entities. And sir, uh, the question is uh, one on the uh, machine settings, what should be the PRF uh, should be there on the machine to detect VSD, sir? Okay, I will say that for pulmonary veins, we should have a pretty low PRF. I usually go to a PRF about 1.3 meters per second. That's a very, very low, much more below low than what you would put for outflows. And uh, if you have machine has uh, the capability of, uh, you know, HD flow, etc., then obviously those things are very helpful. That is one. The second thing is very important. When you put color, don't put color over the entire baby. That's, we are not uh, playing wholly with the fetus, right? So we put color only at the point of interest. So if you want to put, see the pulmonary veins, 
you put the color box only at that area of interest so you are obviously your frame rates anyway when you put color your frame rates are going to come down that's universal because color relies on doppler so you put a small uh, color box and reduce pr up to about 1.3 that's the time when you get uh, the 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 pulmonary veins very clear and the next question is sir how to differentiate persistent truncus from double outlet ventricular pathology sonographically okay i think these are completely different entities altogether and uh, the common arterial trunk is a situation where you have only one outlet double outlet obviously you are saying there are two outlets right so you know if you see two outlets it cannot be common arterial trunk understand so obviously it's a completely different it's not even a differential diagnosis of dorv what is the, uh, the differential diagnosis of a common arterial trunk is what i showed two conditions which can cause a single outlet are tof tetral uh, vst with pulmonary atresia and uh, a common arterial trunk now some people say tof pulmonary atresia sometimes the aorta may be completely coming from the rv so people say dorv pulmonary atresia but those are all complex terms basically there is a bsd and aortic override and there is only one outflow that is aorta and the other outflow is getting blood reversed through the ductus so i think the differential diagnosis of a common arterial trunk is actually a top pulmonary atresia most of you got that wrong because i think most of them have not internalized the concept of uh, these two uh, entities dorv obviously you have two outflow tracts both coming from the right ventricle and uh, of course uh, it's like there are different different types of dorv again uh, it's like very difficult to discuss those in detail here because it will take a lot of time but the most common type of dorv is two types one is a top type with normally related right arteries and second is the tga type which is the transverse outflow so obviously this is this uh, common arterial trunk and the dorv are not really seriously dds okay maybe 5 more minutes dinat and yes, after sir. that we can probably use email to answer sure sir so the question is uh, that how to uh, detect aortic interruption sir ah that is a very good question i think that is something which is very important i did show the some of these uh, exam pictures of aortic interruption and uh, the 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 most important clue for aortic interruption is that Uh, when we look at the three vessel view you will find that normally in the three vessel view the aorta and the pa both will go up to the spine and join in the aortic interruption typically there will be a gap between the aorta where the ascending and the mid thoracic aorta and the trachea so that's a gap second is that when you put color the proximal aorta may have a forward flow blue flow but the distal aorta typically will have a retrograde flow in the 3 vt view so that is two and of course when you go for the sagittal view of the aortic arch you will find that the ascending aorta is very small and often there will be lack of continuity between the ascending and the descending aorta so that is the characteristic sign and the descending aorta will be completely supplied by the ductus arteriosus so the ductus will continue as the descending aorta while the ascending aorta goes to transverse arch and will get completely stopped there we have actually published the use of uh, 3d 4d stick in the diagnosis of uh, aortic arch interruption um, it is there in circulation 2018 if you put my name and uh, this paper 3d stick in aortic interruption it will come up uh, in circulation cardiovascular imaging it's a very we are nicely described all the features in that paper maybe you can read that but these are the clues fine sir so thank you sir uh, now we can wind up for the today session and uh, so i will share the questions to you so yes so what will... you can do is uh, uh, you can put the questions i will try to answer as much as possible uh, not yes. today or tomorrow for sure and yes. uh, over the next week i will put down the answers sometimes if the questions are repeated i will try to put common answers and then you can communicate the person with ventricular inversion obviously you can probably give my email and so, they can directly ask me that question because it's a pretty a difficult question you know maybe i can just say there is this entity called ventricular inversion just to sort of uh, end with the curiosity see when you say ventricular inversion normally you let us look at 
how the heart segments are connected. The atria connect to ventricles and ventricles connect to outflows. So when you say atrioventricular ventricular concordance, right atrium goes to right ventricle, left atrium goes to left ventricle. Then outflow LV to iota and RV to PA. Okay. In TGA, you have atrioventricular concordance, that is RA to RV and LA to LV, but ventricular arterial discordance, that is LV to PA and RV to iota. In ventricular inversion, what happens is you only have atrioventricular discordance, but the outflows are normal, that is RA goes to LV and LA goes to RV. RV gives rise to PA and LV gives rise to iota. It is like a TGA, but this is how you distinguish. It's obviously complex for many people and it needs more discussions. Maybe we can have a direct discussion with the concerned question, the person who asked the question. Yeah. Okay, sure, so sir. shall we wind up? Sure, sir. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful session. And there are a lot of questions are there and still it's coming. So I thanking all the viewers also for your patience listening and uh, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, webinar and uh, I would uh, next 16th Jan so we'll have a next webinar from Dr. Balu Vednyasan for this fetal echo series part 2 so I would like I the same the uh, details of this program the webinar we will share soon thank you for joining us thank you thank you very much thank you Thank you very Thank much. You, Bye and good night and happy weekend to everyone.